Hello Turtles! Welcome! It is Monday, June 1st. Good grief, it's June already. My word. 2020, and this is the Young Adults and Career class at Trinity. We are uh, finishing out our book here. We're in the Gospel Project with the lamb on the cover, and we are in the last lesson. It's Unit 21, Session 4, Jesus Teaches About Living Water. I'm uh, glad you're here. Uh, we have a, a great lesson, and what I hope you'll think is a great lesson today. And um, let's start in prayer and get right into it. Holy Father God, Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior. I thank you for being here with us. Lord, I ask you to speak your words through me today to um, make this lesson understandable and to uh, draw everyone that watches it closer to you, Father God, as we study your word, study your ways, and and come to know you and love you better uh, every day of our lives. You're so good to us. We thank you for your blessings, and we ask you to bless this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, in your books, we are in page um, 123, 123 in your books, and we're going to be looking today at John uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4 and uh, 7 through 14. Actually, I'm going to go a little bit further than that, but um, that'll that'll get us started anyway. This is um, a pretty well-known story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman that uh, he meets at the well. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. And as always, we'll throw some applications in there about how it applies to living right now today. Um, so let's jump in here and we will start again. It's, uh, the gospel of John chapter four and actually I'm going to start at verse four and what I'm going to do is just read, um, the, the book has the scripture divided up into sections. I'm actually just going to read the whole section and then we'll, we'll back up and, and, uh, look through it a piece at a time. So, um, John four, four. Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jo Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. 
The woman said, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you now am he. Just then the disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asks, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages and, the, and he harvests the crop for eternal life so that sower and reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans came from that town, or many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days, and because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this man really is the Savior of the world. Okay, so that's our that's our scripture. Now let's back up and go through it. Um, there's one thing I want to make a note of here before we get started uh, for real, and that is, I think, it's just my opinion, but I think that we just saw in that scripture Jesus having the time of his life. I think he was having a ball. He was in the center of his mission in, in this scripture. Um, I'm a drummer, right? And the hardest thing for a drummer, at least the hardest thing for me, is to stay in the center of the beat. It's easy to lag the beat and be a little bit behind, just to, not, not enough to throw everything off, but just a little bit behind the beat. Or it's hard, it's uh, or especially easy for me to push the beat a little bit. I always tend to go too fast. So you're either, you're always trying to hit that middle ground between lagging the beat and pushing the beat. And it's hard to be square in the middle of the beat, okay? Um, it's hard to stay there. But when you are there, oh, it feels so good. I mean, you know, if you're if you're playing to a metronome and you can't hear the metronome, you know, you're in the center of the beat. I think Jesus was in the center of the beat in this story in his uh, in his ministry. Here he was talking to somebody who was ready to hear him. He wasn't talking to somebody who was loaded down with a bunch of preconceived ideas and um, a whole bunch of religion that they had to overcome. Here was a uh, just a, a random person, and he was able to do exactly what he came to this earth to do, and I think he was having a ball, and we'll, we'll get more into that, but even when the um, disciples came back and said, Rabbi, we know you're hungry, eat something, and he said, I got food you know nothing about. I think he was having a blast. So, um, and my food, what was it? My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And he was in the middle of the beat. He was exactly in his element at that time. So um, I, I enjoy that story just because it's good to see Jesus having fun. Nobody picking on him. You know, it's just, it's, he's doing what he's supposed to do and it's going well. Anyway, okay, so um, let's back up for a minute and do a little bit of um, background here. Um, specifically, the, um, the background I'm talking about is what's the big deal with Samaritans? Um, you hear, heard about the Good Samaritan, you've heard about, um, and, and this thing here um, in verse nine, it says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans, okay? 
So I went back and did some research on that because I knew that was the case. I knew they didn't get along. What I didn't know was why. So I um, went back and did a little research on it. And here's the deal. When um, Israel split back in, in, what was that, 9-something B.C., I think, 900 and some odd B.C., um, just after the death of Solomon, um, the, the, the kingdom split. And the, uh, let me get this straight. Now, the uh, northern kingdom retained the name of Israel, and 10 of the 12 Jewish tribes stayed in the north in Israel. The southern kingdom became known as Judah. Uh, that was the, the southern part, and only two uh, tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, went down south. And um, Jerusalem was the capital city, and it became the capital city of Judah, the southern kingdom. All right. Uh, Israel sort of um, reassigned their, their own capital city, and that was Samaria. People from Samaria are Samaritans, okay? So that's, uh, that's where that came from. There was a lot of bad blood there. The family had broken up. Um, there was a lot of hard feelings when the, when the kingdom divided, um, and there was, there was a lot of bad blood there. Then, um, some years later, Israel was attacked by the Assyrians. The Assyrians sacked the place, just took it over. And with Samaria being the big city and the capital city, the um, Assyrians came in and they took the leaders. They took the wealthy, they took the educated, they took the leaders, and they just herded them out of town. They got them out and they scattered them all over. They scattered them far and wide so it would be much, much harder for them to reorganize. Okay, They left the regular people alone. Um, because they didn't perceive them as being a threat to their control. But the, the leaders, the elites, they scattered them to the far reaches. So, um, and it was pretty effective. The, they also brought their own pagan religion with them when they came. And um, although it was still a majority um, Israelite town, Samaria was, there obviously was a lot of influence of the pagan religions. And what ended up happening over time was that there, there was a um, watered down, it, it was still sort of Judaism, but it was a watered down, bastardized, um, diluted, perverted sort of, um, of religion that, that sort of came out of it. And also, since there were a lot of um, Assyrians that moved into town, they began to intermarry and all of that, which was against the law of Deuteronomy for the Jews to intermarry with pagan uh, uh, cultures. And they broke that hard. So there were, uh, that was why this, the Samaritans were considered by the Jews to be uh, substandard. They were considered to be half-breeds, um, uh, they called them dogs a lot. Um, they were not considered to be true Jews. Um, so, again, that sort of cemented in place the hard feelings between the two, and, and the Jews definitely looked down on the Samaritans. So, um, we've heard the story of the Good Samaritan. All right, that was the man that was going down the street, a story that, uh, that Jesus told that this... Uh, Samaritan man was going down the street and he found a man on the side of the road that had been beaten and robbed and was near death. They almost beat him to death. And this Samaritan man took the injured man, nursed him back to health, took him to a hotel, paid the man's ways, uh, paid the man's uh, hotel bill and told the uh, landlord at the hotel, the keeper of the, of the hotel, to take care of the guy and make sure he gets good medical care and I'll be back through here in a couple of weeks, and if there's anything else to be paid, I'll pay for it then, but take care of this man. In other words, and you know, there was no uh, obligation involved. It was just something he did out of the good of it, goodness of his heart, and the story of the Good Samaritan came from that. What we need to understand is from the Jewish perspective in these days, uh, Jesus never used the term Good Samaritan. That's just what became the name of the story over the years, but um, the thought of a Samaritan person doing that was totally foreign to the Jews. They thought of the Samaritans as being beyond um, redemption, 
uh, what's the word, incorrigible, um, just incapable of doing anything good, okay? It's sort of, uh, and I tried and tried to find an analogy to put it in today's terms, but it would be sort of like the sweet dirt bag, okay? It's uh, just a, a contradiction in terms. The Good Samaritan was just a contradiction in terms that they... Um, so that story, while it's a nice story to us, it was totally radical to them. The, the thought of somebody that was a Samaritan being able to do something like that, and Jesus sort of threw it back in their face um, that Samaritan did this. No, no, that did not go over. So that's um, kind of where we are. Jesus also in Luke 17 and 12 through 16 used a line when Jesus healed um, 10 lepers. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that to heal leprosy was unheard of. It was a, a miraculous thing, and Jesus did it frequently. Well, he healed 10 of them at the same time, and they all ran off hooting and hollering and celebrating and all of that. Only one of them came back, excuse me, and uh, one came back to thank Jesus, fell at his feet and was, you know, weeping and, and praising him and thanking him. And they made the point of saying, and he was a Samaritan. Okay, that's a slap in the face to the Jews. Okay, that uh, a Samaritan was the one guy that came back to thank Jesus. So there was the story of the good Samaritan. There was the, the one that uh, came back after being healed of leprosy. And now this is a Samaritan woman. So this is a um, um, an example of radicalism uh, for that day and time. There were more radical things in this story, and it's right from the right from the beginning. Um, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said, because his disciples had gone into town. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she says. Um, Jesus was breaking all kinds of social rules, social conduct rules in this time. First off, he was speaking with the Samaritan. Okay, that's that was that would make you pretty much a social outcast right there. He was also a lone single man talking to a lone single woman. You did not do that. No, 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 no. Uh, big social rules against doing that. Um, it was totally improper, and Jesus totally didn't care. He didn't care that she was a Samaritan, he didn't care that she was a woman, he didn't care that there was nobody around. And um, he, he just didn't care. And that's another point of the story is that Jesus brought his message, his love, his salvation, his redemption. He brought his message to the world. The Jews wanted to keep him for themselves. The Jews wanted their Messiah to be their Messiah. Uh, Jesus was not having it. Jesus was here for everyone that will call on him, everyone that will believe in him, everyone that will follow him and give their lives to him. That's who Jesus is here for. And whether you're Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, mobster, uh, drunk, prostitute, whoever you are, Jesus doesn't care. All right. You're a human being. You are created in the image of God. And Jesus came for you. All right. Um, it's not about who you are. It's not about are you a Samaritan? Are you a dirtbag? Are you lower, lower than? Or are you elite? Are you rich? Are you self-sufficient? Are you self-made? We love that in America, the self-made man. Um, are you a self-made person? Jesus doesn't care. He came for you too. All right. So whether you think you need him or whether you think you don't, Jesus came for you. Um, this Samaritan woman was in need. She was, um, she was in, the only word I can think of is incomplete. She was an incomplete woman that had, um, had need of something. So are we. Uh, we all have different needs, but she was needy for a solution to her problems in life, and that is just a description of all of us. And she came to get water. That was her immediate physical problem at the moment, was she needed water for the house. Um, 
Jesus said he was able to offer her living water. One more thing before we get off of the setup here is this woman came by herself to the well, which doesn't seem like any big deal, but going to the well was sort of a social thing in those days. That's when the women of the of the village or the town got together and they would come in and they would all meet at the well and it was sort of a, you know, while they're drawing water is sort of a social time and it's a way to get away from the, from the uh, humdrum of, of daily life. This woman wasn't with the group. She came in the heat of the day. The, the other ladies probably came, you know, when it was cooler, either in the morning or the evening. Um, this lady came in the heat of the day and she came by herself. So she's probably a social outcast. Any woman in a small town who has had five husbands and is now is living with a guy, I would say the other ladies around there are going to cut her a wide berth. She was probably a, um, a social outcast uh, because of her past. All right. And your past in a small town can dog you for from now on. Uh, it is a hard thing to get away from. Um, everybody knows everybody in a small town, okay? And um, your past, if it's checkered, can be awfully, awfully hard in a small town to overcome. But she was thirsty for something. She had, she had needs in her life. She was going to fill the need of filling her water jug. Jesus was there to fill the need of her soul. Um, and he had a little trouble getting that across to her at first, um, when he was saying that, uh, I'll give you living water and you'll never be thirsty again. She said, cool, cause I don't want to have to keep coming to this. Well, water's heavy, eight pounds a gallon. So, um, water is heavy. And she kept thinking, wow, okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to have, you know, inside plumbing or something, <laughs> but she was thinking in physical terms, Jesus was thinking way, way, way deeper than that. Um, we, without Jesus, without God, we are all basically enemies of God. We are sinners. We are born into it. Um, human nature, even if you're born as the sweetest, lovingest person in the world, human nature will overcome you eventually and you become a sinner just like everybody else. Um, the good news for us is that God loves his enemies and he is always working toward reconciling with us. Okay. Um, he made a way, I'm reading from the book here, he made a way for us to receive the living water that we so desperately need, the gift of the Holy Spirit who grants eternal life to those in whom he dwells. Jesus made this gift possible for us by his death on the cross in our place. Um, and we'll get more into that as we go along. But Jesus was addressing the needs of this woman's soul. And... Um, she finally got it. She, she started catching on here eventually. But basically what Jesus was doing here, if you, if you look for the, I, I was sort of looking for the, the common thread, the thing that runs all the way through this story. And there is one. And basically what it comes down to is Jesus was putting feet to the commandment. He was putting reality to the commandment of Matthew 5 and 44, which is to love your enemies and love those who persecute you, okay? He was talking to an enemy of the Jewish people, the Samaritan, um, and he showed her the unconditional love that God is so good at showing, okay? Um, he, was, he was living out, he was giving us a, a picture of what it looks like to love your enemies. And I'm, I'm going to read this out of the book here, but this is a cool story that I'd never heard of. And uh, it is slightly incomplete. So if you are looking in the book, I'm going to add a, a couple of lines to it because I've researched the story further and they, they left out what I think is a pretty good part. Um, so in the early days of the American Revolution, there lived at Ephrata or Ephrata. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Anyway, it's a town in Pennsylvania. There was in that town a pastor, a Baptist pastor by the name of Peter Miller, who enjoyed the friendship of General George Washington. Wasn't president yet, he was general. Also residing in that town was Michael Whitman, an evil-minded sort who did all in his power to abuse and oppose the pastor. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason. 
Treason's a big deal. They shoot you dead for that. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to death. Pastor Miller, traveling 70 miles on foot, walked to Philadelphia to plead for Whitman's life. When admitted into Washington's presence, Pastor Miller at once begged for the life of the traitor. No, Peter, said Washington, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the preacher, he is the bitterest enemy I have. What, cried Washington, you walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I will grant the pardon. And he did. Peter Miller took Michael Whitman from the very shadow of death and returned him, no longer an enemy, but a friend, to a Friday. And when Washington asked him why, this is what I looked up later, when Washington asked him why he did it, why would you walk for days to save the life of your biggest enemy, your worst enemy? His answer was pretty cool. He said, I did it because Jesus did as much for me. We are all enemies of Jesus in our natural state. We are all enemies of God, enemies of Jesus in our natural state. But Jesus lives out the commandment of love your enemies. And that's what he's best at. So um, another thing to uh, keep in mind here, the Jews and the Samaritans were expecting the arrival of a prophet who would be like Moses and answer all their questions, especially about who is correct in their worship war. They had different ideas about how to worship. Um, there's, there's something here that hit me that I want to make plain. Jesus was living in a divided kingdom. There was Israel on the north, Judah on the south. Jesus was uh, um, the Lion of Judah, right? You've heard Jesus referred to as that. Um, it was a divided kingdom. It was a divided religion. The Jews had uh, been scattered and they had had uh, pagan um, culture uh, infiltrate their, their population. There were divisions all over the place. The kingdom was divided. The religion was divided. The, the, the culture was divided. Sound familiar? Uh, can we apply that to today? That... Um, there was a lot of division. There were a lot of different ideas about what was right. People were mad at one another. People didn't want to hear the other one's opinion. Everybody was sealed into their rightness of, of what they think is right. Division always makes us weaker, whether as believers or as nations, as a church, as believers. Division always makes us weaker, and there's something that it's the easiest thing in the world to fall into, and it is the most dangerous. And that is that right now today, in the body of Christ, we have strong divisions. There are people that have destroyed friendships, destroyed relationships over things that, not to step on anybody's toes, but it just flat doesn't matter. Um, what kind of music do you play? Do you like drums and guitar and bass, or do you like organ and piano and traditional hymns? That is no reason to break up a church. We have things um, that, that just don't matter that people get all wrapped around the axle about. And okay, if you want to argue about them later, argue about them later. But right now, in this culture, in today's society, we have bigger things to worry about. We have got to come together with our Christian uh, friends, neighbors, brothers, and sisters. We have got to. Because what made it so easy for the Assyrians to um, overtake Israel? Because half the country was gone. The other half of the country wasn't even in the fight. Okay? Um, divided made them weak. And that's the way it goes. Talked a couple of week, uh, weeks ago, I was telling you about Andy Andrews, my, one of my favorite authors, and he was... Uh, He's a historian, along with several other of his talents, but um, he tells the story of Joshua Chamberlain. And this one guy, it's a, it's a great story, but this one guy was 
credited with winning the Battle of Gettysburg for the Union Army in the Civil War. Um, he certainly didn't do it by himself, but he made one decision that turned the tide of that battle, and the Union won and eventually won the war. A lot of historians believe that if the South would have won the Battle of Gettysburg, they would have won the war. It would have been over in a few months, and the South would have won. There would have been two countries. There would have been the United States of America and the Confederate States of America. And these uh, people also are of the opinion that if the country had divided once, it was probably going to be divided again. And their best estimate is that, um, it's kind of a broad estimate, you know, it's just somebody's opinion, but their best estimate is that right now today, if the South would have won the Civil War, the United States, what we consider the United States, the contiguous United States, would be somewhere between two and nine individual countries. In other words, it wouldn't look like the United States, it would look much more like Europe with a bunch of small countries on one landmass. If that had happened when World War II came along, there would not have been a country big enough, strong enough, rich enough, populous enough to take on a battle of two fronts on different sides of the world at the same time. Germany on one side, Japan on the other. We would not have been able to do it. We would have lost World War II and the world would look totally different um, than it does now. Evil would have won is basically what it comes down to. Um, divided makes us much, much, much weaker. Um, so we'll get off of that, but that's that's a, a main carry away from this. Oh, and there's another little story. Let me throw this one out real quick. Um, quick story, and I can't. I heard it on the radio driving down the road one day, so I don't know how to give it credit. But it was the story of um, Russia in 1916, 1917, just before the Russian Revolution. The church of Russia, the main church in Moscow, was, um, or St. Petersburg, whichever it was, anyway, the main church was having a bitter fight. And basically what the fight came down to, they were fighting over, do we want to use the red long candles or the uh, blue short candles? And the church was in an uproar about it, over what size and color of candles to use in the service. And they were having a bitter fight. People were leaving the church, yada, 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 the whole deal. Down the street at that time, literally down the street, a couple of blocks down the street, the Bolsheviks were plotting the overthrow of the Russian government. They were organized. They were of one accord. And they took over Russia. And Vladimir Lenin was their leader. Um, things didn't go so well. But that's another picture of division over meaningless things as opposed to organization with one accord. Okay. Um, so very important. Anyway, um, and the kind of the last thing here is that Jesus among the Jews was pretty hesitant to claim that he was the Messiah. And the book does a better job here than I can. It said he likely wanted to avoid the political and military baggage that many Jews had attached to their expectation of the Messiah. Um, in the company of a bunch of Jews in, in the synagogues, if Jesus said he was the Messiah, well, he had already experienced that uh, when he went home to Nazareth, right? You remember that from a couple of weeks ago. He said, I am he, I, I am the Messiah. And they ran him out of town and were going to throw him off a cliff. Um, he got away from them. We're not quite sure how. It just said he disappeared through the, cloud, uh, through the crowd and got away. <clears throat> But um, that did not go over. That did not go over one little bit. Um, so, and there were a lot of times when he would uh, perform a miracle, heal somebody or whatever, and he would tell them, don't, don't say anything about this. A lot of the time they did anyway. But uh, he was hesitant to say among the Jews who he was. But for this woman, the Samaritan woman, uh, he came right out and told her. 
She said, we know a Messiah is coming. He said, yeah, that would be me. Um, and then he proved it, okay? Or at least he proved it to her satisfaction and to the whole town's satisfaction. Um, and that was one of the first... Um, one of the first times that he said, yes, I am the Messiah, the whole town believed him. And this town that is the enemy of the Jews, pretty much didn't say all of them, but a whole lot of people came to believe in Jesus and they became Christian people, um, even though they were the enemy of the Jews. Um, and like I say, that sort of bends back around to the Jews wanted their Messiah to be their Messiah. Jesus said, no, that's, that's not the way we're playing this. I'm coming for anybody who will follow me, anybody who will give their lives to me and follow me and do what I say. Uh, those are going to be my people. I don't care what your ethnicity or your background or your religion is. Um, so that is, um, that's about it. There's a, a, a story that I've told you all before of a, um, a lady pilot that I used to fly with, and she was a... Um, in your face atheist she was an antagonistic atheist and when she found out found out that i was a guy of faith uh buddy it was game on and uh we were locked in a cockpit together about the size of a walk-in small walk-in closet and there's no getting away you're there for the duration and she would pick on me but um we had some really interesting talks um uh, sort of contentious at times, but we had some really interesting talks, and I don't think either of us changed the other one's mind, but who knows, maybe so. But one thing that she said to me that has always stuck with me, she said, why are you telling me all this stuff? Why are you trying to change my point of view? And then the, the, the kicker was, what's in it for you? Okay. And, you know, from the worldly perspective, that is a totally valid question. What's in it for you? Because she wasn't used to somebody um, caring enough to confront her on her attitudes and her beliefs and her way of being. She wasn't used to that. She wanted to know what's in it for me. And you know what? I didn't have a great answer for her at that time. Um, in fact... I had to think about it for a while, but um, I was doing what we're supposed to do. I can't claim credit for it because she pushed me into it. She started, she always started the, the conversation slash fight. Uh, she always started it, but um, what is in it for us? Well, what's in it for us, and this is not an original idea, but it just crystallized it better than I could. Um, what's in it for us is the same thing of if you see the best movie you've ever seen, what are you going to do? You'll tell people about it. If you just had the best restaurant meal you've ever had in your life, you're going to tell people about it. If you know of a cure for a dread disease that will kill people, has a 100% mortality rate, and you have the cure for it, what kind of a person would I be if I didn't go tell people about it? If I tried to keep that all to myself? Well, there is a dread disease that will kill people eternally and send them to hell. And it's called being human with no help. Um, we're born sinners. All of us. All have fallen short of the glory of God, right? Um, Human nature will lead us into sin, and sin will lead us away from God, and away from God is hell. And we, that's the way it is, that's the way we are. But we have the cure, and the cure is a young man that lived 20, uh, over 2,000 years ago, and he has the cure, and the cure is to believe him and follow him and study him, seek his wisdom learn what he knew and he gives freely one of the best lines in the bible to me is um, and i wish i'd looked it up but i haven't i don't know the chapter and verse anyway it says um, you who are simple be simple no more we 
we can gain in wisdom, we can gain in knowledge, we can gain uh, in being Christ-like, and that is great news. We don't have to stay the way we've been. That's some of the best news in the Bible to me. But anyway, Jesus lived this out. He found a person who was kind of his enemy, somebody he wasn't really supposed to associate with, and he turned her life around, and she, in turn, led her entire town to salvation. A day doesn't get any better than that. That's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. That's what Jesus wants us to do, and he just showed us how to do it. So study this lesson well, um, and it will not always work. Remember what he tried in Nazareth in his hometown. That didn't go over big at all. But here among people that um, were just as needy, it went over great. He had a great day that day, and it's fun to watch Jesus having a wonderful day. I wish you a wonderful day. I hope you have a great time. Thank you for taking your time to come here and, and listen. I hope you got something out of it. I certainly did in, in studying for it. So let's finish in prayer and we'll head on our way. Holy Father God, Lord, we love you. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the example that Jesus gave with the Samaritan woman at the well. It's a beautiful story, Father. It's It speaks to us and it speaks to who we are and it speaks to who we want to become and it's it's a beautiful story of reconciliation it's a beautiful story of a person being saved after a terrible background it's it's just a it's a it's a wonderful story and we thank you for it father we thank you for offering to give us your wisdom your word says that if anyone lacks wisdom ask god and he gives freely and without finding fault oh what a wonderful line. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. Lord, as we go off and, and do our week's um, work here today, Father, we ask you to be with us. We ask you to make us effective and successful in your kingdom to show us how to do what Jesus did and live the way Jesus lived and draw us closer to you every day. And Holy Lord, let the world be our mission field. And again, make us successful, make us effective in your kingdom. And in the meantime, provide for us, protect us, and bring us back here safely again next week. We love you, Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you again for coming. We love you. We appreciate you being here. And um, I guess Nick's got it next week. So um, we will be in touch with um, more uh, scheduling information, that sort of thing, about how and where we'll do our virtual meeting next week. We love you. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.